Hi, welcome to this regular school meeting of Thursday, October 20, uh, Thursday, October 12th, 2023. Um, we're open just a little bit late because we were having some technical problems. Uh, we have no public speakers, but I would like to welcome our AHS representatives, Amy Kolaru and uh, Mo Hagenbuk. Um, and do you want, oh, and I forgot to read. Liz, we don't have the land acknowledgement here. Oh, I thought you had it, I'm sorry about that. No, I don't have it. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll read it in a little while if you can just like email it to me. Um, and uh, so I'll, pu I'll bump to our AHS representative. So do you folks have anything you wanna uh, talk about today? Oh, yeah. Okay, um, well, the for sports to start, um, the girls cross country team won the Bay State Invitationals and the boys got fourth, but that was a good. Um, we had a pep rally and it was really fun. Everyone was pepped and rallied. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then club day was today and uh, there is I think over 40 clubs yeah, and it was fun. It was fun. There's a lot of new ones, and it was mm -hmm. a cool experience. Everyone. Cool. Amy, Amy, no, great, thank you. Okay, and and as we've said before, you folks are welcome to pop in, and I'm going to try and remember to ask you after the presentations if you have questions. If you don't, please just raise your hand, and and um, I'll get you then. Uh, and then our we start our next. Uh, presentation with the diversity and hiring report by Mr. Spiegel. Oh, and I forgot to say our superintendent is attending from home and uh, on Zoom and our uh, assistant superintendent deputy. is, I'm sorry? Deputy. deputy. Deputy, sorry. Our deputy superintendent will be acting here in her place. Um, Mr. Spiegel. Uh, our AEA representative, I think, is also on. Oh, yes, Zoom. yes, our AEA, yeah. yes, our AEA representative, Ms. Fernandez, and we are happy to see her here also. Do you want me to stay here or do you want me to go to the table? How, what would you prefer? Um, I think you've got a good mic there. Okay, just... if you can hear me. Okay, I think. Uh, uh, give me a second. Okay, give me a second for the presentation to come up. I mean, I can start before the presentation comes up. I just want to, this is the annual staffing report uh, that goes over some of our new hires and some of our, um, <coughs> excuse me, demographic data in the district. I want to thank uh, Kelly Piggott, who's the assistant director of HR in my office, did a, probably the bulk of the work preparing the slides and helping with this. I also want to acknowledge Mr. Coleman, who helped with some of the data on, on the slides and uh, our whole team. Um, the other thing I want to say, and I, will, I was going to get to, um, staffing and especially new hiring, hiring new staff in the district is a team effort. It requires all of the hiring managers in the district, all the principals, assistant principals, curriculum leaders, special ed coordinators who are actually interviewing the people and hiring the people. Um, and that leads to our HR department, uh, Kali uh, Tabor in my office who has been managing our new onboarding process masterfully and making sure that everyone gets the paperwork they need which is all online. We are working to become more paperless in our office and have all of the new hire paperwork done um, done ver ver via our new our unified talent applicant tracking and records platforms. Um, the business office, which tracks all of our budgets and hires and makes sure that, that we have positions for all the hires that we have. Um, I wanna thank, uh, obviously, the superintendent's office, the deputy superintendent's office, special ed office, who do a lot of work um, in the hiring and getting people onboarding, onboarded. Our payroll department, which is always busy in the summer, that does the, the work getting people into our system so they can get paid. Um, our IT department that gets everyone their technology that they need. 
um, and our new teacher uh, orientation leaders, new uh, mentor coordinators, and mentors um, who do a lot of work with our new staff. The AEA also is a partner in this and spends a lot of time at orientation um, getting new teachers and educators the information they need um, as part of their, uh, the union contract. Um, so it's a team effort throughout the district to get new people onboarded. Um, and, and every department, and not just the educators, uh, the, in the, the teachers, I mean, we, everyone's an educator, but the in food service and traffic and, um, and after school, every department. Are we, okay, need a minute to get the presentation up. You want me to? Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Anyone, oh, you don't have. Anyone who's on Zoom would be able to share it if they have it on their computer. Or, uh, oh, if they have it on. Oh, I mean. Yeah. I don't. I'm not on Zoom. I mean, I can. Do you want me to log into Zoom? Would you all like me to drive? <laughs> I can pull slides up. That might be helpful, <laughs> yes. Thank you. All right, I got it. Hold on. The wizard is speaking. <laughs> <laughs> Don't whoa. look behind the curtain. <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. Huh. Okay. Okay. Can you make that? It's a PDF. It's not That's okay. Yeah, I can scroll through this way. But can you make it bigger? Yeah. Uh, uh, um, well, I can. At the bottom, that magnifying glass at the bottom. Good, Keep it. perfect. Okay, all right, so you can go to the next, scroll down. All right, uh, so I wanna, everything, um, we have a vision and mission in APS now, and we wanna make sure that everything is grounded in our vision and mission. And so we are, the vision of Arlington Public Schools is to be an equitable educational community where all learners feel a sense of belonging, experience growth and joy, and are empowered to shape their futures, their own futures and contrib contribute to a better world. Um, so in that vision, all learners include all educators, all staff in the district. So we want to make sure that everyone has that ability. Um, if you can want to scroll down, I'm going to talk about um, a little bit about some of the, the things that we're working on in the strategic plan, go over some staff demographic data, an overview of new hires, so an overview of the exits and reasons for staff departures. I'll review some of the vacancies we currently have, some current and future initiatives, and then some time for questions. So if you wanna scroll down. Um, so in strategic priority two, valuing all staff. So we have a new strategic plan in the district. Um, we're working on different areas. Strategic priority two is really about staff and employees in the district. The Arlington Public Schools will recruit and retain an excellent and diverse workforce by creating a collaborative and supportive culture for all staff, providing high quality and relevant professional development, expanding leadership opportunities and shared decision making, and prior, prioritizing representation, diverse perspectives, and expertise. So our work is grounded in this priority as well. So we wanna go over the next slide. We're just gonna go over some of the demographics that we have in the district now. So this, uh, 
the percentages here in the chart here represent all employees in the district other than substitutes, coaches, and community ed. So that, um, and what the demographic breakdown is uh, for all of those um, employees. One of the things um, that always comes up and is a question is about the not self-identified. So in our new onboarding system, there is a mandatory form that employees have to fill out on the, uh, the identification, uh, how they identify in terms of ethnicity. However, in that form, they have the option to not identify. So it's an affirmative non-identification. So there are still are people who do not identify. They choose not to identify. Um, but it is a form that is required to fill out. And the goal is that we would get more um, identification um, in the future. So you can see the, on that slide what the uh, percentages are of, our, of the categories uh, that we have for American Indian or Alaskan Na Native, uh, Asian or Pacific Islander, Black or African American, Hispanic or Latino, not self-identified or two or more races, and white. Um, the next slide uh, talks about all new hires since last October 1st. Um, and where we are with the percentages there. And so you can see the breakdown. The left column is all new hires, and the right is all employees, and where we are in terms of um, the differences. We are, have made some progress in increasing the diversity of some of our staff, um, but uh, we are, you, know, you can see what the percentages are in, for each of the, um, each of the categories. The next slide talks about the new Unit A educators. So that's all teachers and people in the Unit A bargaining uh, unit. It includes uh, special ed related service providers, um, all classroom teachers, special teacher, uh, specialist teachers, um, and several other categories of educators in that bargaining unit. Um, you can see in the new Unit A educators since October 1st last year what the percentages are. And then in the, on the left and on the right, you can see for the last four years what um, those percentages have been. I will, at, at the next slide will sort of uh, probably uh, highlight this a little more. We tend, to, we are still a more white district in terms of educators than we are in terms of students. And our goal is to have more representation of educators uh, that more closely mirror the uh, experience of our students in the district. And so the next slide um, breaks down where we are. Oh, one more up. You went one too far, I think. So, um, the students in the district, um, through the, the data we have, um, where we're about 3.3% black or African American, 1.39% uh, in A unit A for that category, a very small percentage of American Indian or Alaskan Native. Asian, there's a much larger representation of Asian students than staff in the district in Unit A, um, a much larger percentage of Hispanic or Latino. Um, in, and then um, you can see the two more races and the white. And again, you know, we, we've known this is not new that the, we're, um, the, we, we don't have um, the balance of the, the representation. That's something we've been working on for, for years and we'll continue to work on and as a challenge. And I can talk a little bit about the challenges we have um, in um, increasing the diversity of our staff, which is part of our strategic plan. Um, the next slide is a little small, but if you look on Novus, you can, uh, you can uh, zoom in a little bit more where we break down the percentages by different unions or types of employees. So you can see that in certain um, areas in the district, um, we have increased the representation of staff of color um, in, certain, in certain departments and in certain um, areas. Um, you know, when we have a very, the, the unit A is our largest single uh, unit in this chart and so 
you can see we have a lot more employees in unit A, and so we may have the same number of individuals or more in unit A, but the percentages are a little bit uh, different, as you can see. Um, the next slide, sorry, is just a, more of a breakdown, and we're breaking down sort of specifically Hispanic or Latino and the breakdown um, of AEA Unit A, AEA Unit D, which is the paraprofessionals, and students, and where what the, um, the representation is among those uh, groups. The AEA Unit A is the more orange color, uh, Unit D is yellow, and the students are blue. The next line, the next slide goes to black or African American, same breakdown with Unit A, Unit D, and students, and where we are. And you can see that Unit D, which is our paraprofessionals, is a more diverse, has more representation of people of color in that bargaining unit, and that is an area of, of opportunity for the district, I think, for, um, because I think s some of the people in those units, as you will see, um, uh, in that unit do want to become licensed educators in the future, and we have always hired uh, people from Unit D to move into open Unit A positions, and that's no different this year. So it's opportunity for us to create pathways for more Unit D employees to uh, become Unit A educators if that's what they choose to do, if that's their goal. The next... Uh, The next one is uh, the black and African American representation among AAA members, which are uh, our assistant principals, special ed coordinators, curriculum directors, and a few other categories of employees. Central office um, admi and administrators um, and students. And the, the AAA is the orange line, the central office and administrators are the yellow, and the students is the blue. And the next, um, slide is for Hispanic for the same AAA central office and students. And then the next slide talks about staffing retention rates. This is a DESI. This is DESI data. A lot of the data we got is from DESI. This is a specific um, data point that we can get in DESI. I'm mostly focused on the teachers here on this slide. You can see the superintendent is, uh, you know, we have one superintendent and we've had the same superintendent for a couple of years. Um, the principals, you can see there's 100% retention and that's only because the end date for that it was June 30th mm -hmm. and we all had the same, those principals and the next day we didn't have several of those principals who left, but that was, um, you, know, you, you know this, the, mm -hmm. what happened there. Um, the teachers is the more relevant, I think, data point in this slide mm -hmm. that we are just about where the state is in retention of teachers. About 85%, they're a little under 85 or a little over 85% of teachers retained. Um, so, you know, I think we'd like to be a little bit better than that, but um, that's, that's a goal, again, in the strategic plan that we're working on. Um, the next slide talks about some of the Unit A hires that we've had. So this is, we've hired a lot of educators in Unit A um, since, who started on August 30th or after, um, and the reasons we hired these teachers. Some replaced people who retired, some replaced people who resigned, um, some educators moved to different positions within the district, some are on a leave of absence for the full year, some are budget additions based on the, the, uh, the approved budget that you had um, this past spring. Um, and so, and then, as I said, you know, we always, for the past, as long as I've been here, we have had a way, we've hired teaching assistants or student teachers or substitutes who become licensed educators to take positions in Unit A. And so 15 of the people we've hired this year had been in one of those categories. And we have a very well-educated um, educator force here. 67 of the new educators have at least a master's degree. Some have multiple master's <coughs> degrees or doctorates or PhDs. We also had 12 educators who started sometime between October 2022 and May of 2023 based on vacancies that came up during the year last year, and they continue to work here. Um, 
the next slide talks about the administrator, some of the other uh, people we added this year. You already met the new administrators at the last school committee meeting, so I'm not going to go over them, but you saw that we had a very uh, talented group of uh, new principals, assistant principals, other um, administrators that we've added, central office um, that we've added to the district this year. Um, quite a few new teaching assistants, specialized support paraprofessionals, building subs, tutors, and those are unit D, AEA unit D paraprofessionals. Um, and we are st still hiring for those, as you will see in one of the um, next slides, that we still have some openings. Um, although I think we are better, in better shape this year throughout the district um, than we have, we were last year at this time. Um, we also have new administrative assistants at Arlington High School, Audison, and Central Office. And we have new staff pretty much in almost every department in the district. Um, including our new communications and family engagement department, um, and we always have new staff in, um, and, and a new uh, person in the business office um, who just started uh, recently. Um, in the past month, we've had the new person in the business office and in um, the central office in the deputy superintendent's uh, department, um, and working with curriculum directors. And um, the next slide, talks about the reasons people leave. I mean, this isn't really much different than the past few years. Some people are moving away. You know, we have people have to relocate um, to other parts of the country. Some, uh, one person left for another, to move to another country. Um, we do have issues that sort of surround compensation. Some people have said they're leaving because they're gonna make more money somewhere else. Others, they live too far away and their commute is too long. And one of the reasons they live too far away is because it's easier and more affordable to find housing farther away. And so that goes to compensation as well. Um, some of it also was you know, some dissatisfaction with their position, some burnout, some challenges with caseload, workload. Um, and that can also be tied to compensation in some ways that sometimes compensation might make up for some of those challenges, but maybe you know, maybe not in all cases. Um, we also have several um, staff members who left to be, who were in the unit A, um, who were able to find uh, administrator positions in other districts. They were looking to do that or just move to other districts for career moves. A couple people left the field of education. Sometimes they've decided that, you know, being a teacher or being in uh, an educator wasn't the right field for them and look for something else and a couple people had to leave for family or personal reasons. Um, the next slide talks about the current vacancies we have. Um, we have, uh, just I'll highlight a few of these. We're looking for a so school social worker in the METCO program um, because <coughs> our interim METCO director was the social worker in the METCO program, so we're hiring an interim social worker for the rest of the year. The next two, uh, positions on that list have just been filled. I just talked to the new hires today for the school social worker at Thompson and the design engineering teacher at the high school and those, uh, assuming everything you know goes through, those people will start next week. Um, we're looking for school psychologists. That's been a challenging position to fill in for us and many other districts this year. Multi-language learner, um, which ELL we now refer to as multi MLL, multi-language learner. We're looking for a teacher at Audison, um, and then several paraprofessionals throughout the district. We also are trying to find an administrative assistant in our, we're, we're the, be, the interviewing for administrative assistant in the DIBJ and communications uh, department, which was a recent, newly approved job description from a recent school committee meeting. And we just uh, posted a position and not, that's not on this list, the administrative assistant in the deputy superintendent's office um, that we're sorry to see. Um, the current uh, person, Asha, leave. Um, but uh, so that's an open position for uh, an administrative assistant to work with Mona and her office. And I'll just talk about the re some of the current initiatives, recent things we've done. So we had a networking event in April in conjunction with the Superintendent's Diversity Advisory Committee. For several years, we'd done events with them, which have been known as coffee socials or other things to attract more diverse um, 
candidates into the district. Um, that was a well-attended event. It was a Saturday morning, which was a new time for us to do the event, and we found that that actually ended up being a good day for the event. Um, we have hired people who attended that event. We also had a <coughs> sort of a hiring fair in August, trying to get more candidates in the door. We were able to, that was a well-attended event as well, um, and we have hired several of those, uh, the people who attended, and they're working in the district in primarily paraprofessional positions. I wanna highlight Kate Peretz and her role this year as the leadership development and onboarding program designer. She's working on ways um, to improve the onboarding and training and professional development for administrators and paraprofessionals. Those are really the areas she's been working on. She's also been helping us find some new substitute teachers. Um, we had some shifts in our orientation and mentoring program. We have you know, we had a shorter and more focused orientation program in August, and the new teachers and educators will have more focused PD throughout the school year during the district PD sessions. I want to also highlight strategic working group two, which I referenced in the strategic plan. We have working groups for all of our strategic plan initiatives, and our part of strategic working group two has sort of two parts. One is the recruiting and retention, and one is the professional development, and the groups will be meeting throughout the year to try to develop more strategies for recruitment and retention of staff. And that's really it, if anyone has questions. Great, thank you very much. Um, does anyone, okay, Mr. Schlickman? Hi, um, thank you, a very comprehensive report. Uh, on the slide that we talked about are 83 new educators. Are these all 1.0 people or there? There's a few part-time, um, uh -huh. so it's not, I, yeah, I didn't give you the FTE, I'm sorry about that. Yeah. I have to get that. There's a, the part-time people are mostly in instrumental music. Mm -hmm. Because of the expansion of our instrumental music program, mm -hmm. we've had to hire some 0 0.2, like, like 0 0.3, 0 0.4 um, instrumental music teachers mm -hmm. who will go to different schools for specific instruments, so, yeah. or specific strings, um, brass or whatever, uh, mm -hmm. uh, percussion. So yeah, so those are the primary um, part-time employees. Most of the other employees are full-time. Because I, I just wanted to make sure that when we're, when we're showing new positions, uh, uh, I think that we're like 16 new positions. Yeah. Are they all, are they 16 1.0 or is, are some of those music positions or part-time positions in there? Because I, at this point, we really need to be specific about Okay. what we're adding into the budget. Okay, I will work on that. The other question I have, um, we have a unit D person who says, gee, uh, this is fun, I like doing this, but I wanna get a license. Uh, how can we support them? So that is a, something we're gonna be working on in Strategic <coughs> Initiative 2 in Pathways. I mean, Pathways is part of the strategic plan to create pathways for mm -hmm. um, paraprofessionals to to get licensed, mm -hmm. and um, we do have some partnerships with um, Cambridge College and some other partnerships that I know um, Margaret Creedle Thomas and Superintendent, mm -hmm. Deputy Superintendent, or, and um, Special Ed, um, and uh, Assistant Superintendent for Student Services have been working on different partnerships for um, pathways. We do get information from other districts about opportunities that um, for lower cost licensure programs or lower cost mm -hmm. MTEL, uh, and we do pass those along. So we will, and, and it will be a focus. This, yeah, this seems to be a good way to yeah. diversify the staff if we've got, yes. if that's our most diverse uh, group of employees. I agree. Yeah. Uh, the, the last question is my stock question, and, and you don't have to answer it tonight, but obviously we want to know is what can we do to support this? You know, I think um, I, I may not be able to answer that tonight, but just to continue to support um, the educators, the administrators, the central office to everything that we're doing to try to recruit and retain staff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Thielman. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate this report. I think it's an important thing for the district to give us every year. The, I just have a few questions on the, on, on the common risk uh, re reasons for resignations. Um, do, do you, is this from exit interviews or it's is from this from exit interviews? Not from an automatic. Uh, no, well, we, that's another thing we're going to work on. So the, we are going to, um, I think one of the things that we need to sort of 
focus to get better data, and I'm going to work with Mr. Coleman on this too, is to really have a standard form yeah. that is required. I mean, so one of the things, the exit interview is not always required. People don't always have to. I do, you know, I've been doing it for years, meeting with people one-on-one -on -one to talk to them about, um, you know, what the reason. Sometimes people request an exit interview. Sometimes I, usually I'm reaching out. Um, to request it, but we want to standardize a form and then make an option for people to also meet. Yeah, it, I mean, it, it can help with yeah. more precise trends. Yes. Mm -hmm. But I mean, these, this, this seems like, it feels right. It feels right, it doesn't seem, nothing's a surprise, it's not like new. Mm -hmm. And then the other question is in the, in the, you know, in the did not identify, you are, I mean, the EEOC does allow visual identification if you, yeah. If the district, did you guys have conversations about that? Or? We have had conversations about it. We have not uh, decided to do that at this point, but it's something we could continue to talk about um, whether we do. I mean, and I think it is challenging because we could um, visually identify someone and that might not be how they identify. So, I mean, that's where we want to be careful. Yeah. We have these endless conversations yeah. about this topic. Mm -hmm. At a certain point, you got to like stop it. Yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? You folks have, um, our reps have any questions for this? No? Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Right, this thank is you. really comprehensive and, and it's good to see. I mean, I think especially the information about the Unit D and how we're trying to move some of them up into our teaching force. I mean, they're already in our teaching force, but, but move them up into licensure and, and yeah. I mean, a lot of people have done that already, and I think mm -hmm. it, you know, we want to create more opportunities for people to be able to do that. Yeah, no, that's great. Thank you. Okay, and at this point, let me pull this up. I'm going, oh, great. I'm not, I'm having a hard time here. Okay, there we go. Um, so I am going backwards a little bit to, 6.35, or supposed to be at 6.35 p.m., when I was supposed to read the land acknowledgement. So this comes from file uh, from our policy DEDL uh, in, on April 26, 2021, under Article 85, the Arlington Town Meeting voted <coughs> 202 to <coughs> one or two uh, to encourage all town entities to celebrate and recognize the heritage of the peoples indigenous to Massachusetts and to Arlington by including a land acknowledgement at the beginning of the town's public meetings. And we chose to do this at the beginning of our first meeting, regular meeting in October, whichever or whichever one fell closest to Indigenous Peoples Day, which was celebrated earlier on Monday this week. Uh, and our land acknowledgement reads as follows. We acknowledge that the town of Arlington is located on the ancestral lands of the Massachusetts tribe, the tribe of indigenous peoples from whom the colony, province, and commonwealth have taken their names. We pay our respects to the ancestral bloodline of the Massachusetts tribe and their descendants who still inhabit historic Massachusetts ter ter territories today. I'm sorry, I didn't have that ready right at the start of the meeting, but we do acknowledge and appreciate that. And at this point, we will move on to the outcomes report by Dr. Ford Walker and Mr. Coleman, who is joining us in the front. I, so, hi all, thanks for having me again. Uh, just up front, I've got a bad cough. My doctors tell me I'm fine. It sounds worse than it actually is, so thank you, uh, Liz, for the, the water. I appreciate it. Um, so this is sort of a continuation of a conversation we started a few weeks back. Uh, Dr. Ford Walker and I will be tag teaming this. We'll go back and forth. Uh, I'll take the lead on some of uh, the slides, but then there'll be other information that will be added on as we're proceeding through. Um, hopefully this is something that uh, paints a good picture that leads into the SIP 
presentations that will start to begin, I think, in two weeks and occur all the way until February. So you'll have a good sense now, hopefully, from this presentation, what you might be hearing from each of the schools as they begin their presentations as well. So um, next slide, please. Rob, uh, Mr. Spiegel, very appropriately talked about the, the vision and the uh, mission statement. I just wanted to highlight it again, but in blue, highlight something specific that will be a recurring theme throughout. The, from the vision statement specifically, the sense of belonging, experiencing growth, and joy, and feeling empowered. That's going to be a recurring theme through mine. Uh, from our strategic plan, strategic priority one, uh, just wanted to highlight the idea of equity, excellence, access to rigorous learning experiences for all students. This is something that we're committed to. This is something that we're working on. So just as you know, a little bit of laying the foundation, I just wanted to highlight those two aspects from documents that we've seen. Uh, next slide, please. In the review of the information that we have available, uh, and there's, there's a lot. I, I whittled it down to some key sources. Um, I'm seeing, we're seeing, you're going to hear about three big core takeaways over the next however many months. Uh, first off, our students across the board are enrolling in advanced courses and experiencing academic rigor, but we do have a lot of work to do in terms of equitable access and, and um, uh, seeing good representation from all of our students in all of these courses. Um, belonging for all of our students still should be an area of, of focus. Uh, this is something that, uh, as, when we get to it, we'll see some trends there. Uh, and we do have some possible connections. You know, correlation doesn't mean causation, but there's definitely some correlation with attendance. We talked a little bit about the chronic absenteeism a few weeks ago, uh, and then also mental health. And the final one is, uh, and this initiative has already started, but the elementary ELA should still continue to be a focus in our work that we're doing in a pilot. Um, uh, it will be something that we should monitor and think about. Uh, next slide, please. I don't want to rush through these, but this is just a lot of information that I just wanted to make sure that everybody, public included, understood some of the words that we'll be using. Um, in the strategic plan, there are clearly defined focal groups. Uh, they are these five groups. Students who are supported with an IEP, uh, students who identify as Black, Hispanic, Latinx, uh, students who identify as LBGTQIA+, students who are multilingual learners, uh, students who are from low-income families. So these will be recurring themes. Uh, next slide. And just for all uh, of us to understand, uh, these are the core uh, uh, data sources that were pulled from for this report. Uh, throughout a lot of uh, the analysis over the past, I would say, two to three months, there were other sources that were considered and used, but these are going to be the core uh, data sources that uh, uh, motivate this presentation. Uh, next slide. <coughs> all right. This is going to be super fast. Just a quick reminder of some of the things we spoke about last time, two weeks ago, real fast. The accountability data, uh, MCAS from both 22 and 23, uh, access data, uh, that's informing EL uh, 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 achievement. Uh, there's a chronic, tea, uh, chronic absenteeism. This is all stuff that goes into the accountability. That advanced coursework, those are the two, the three and four that I highlighted last time. Uh, the graduation rates, annual dropout rates, and extended engagement. All of these uh, different buckets factor into our accountability uh, information. Uh, but again, just to highlight the ones that will come up, three and four will be things of focus for today. Uh, next slide. <coughs> Excuse me. So a few things from here, just again as a reminder. Um, low assessment participation. Uh, we'll talk about how our schools did again. Uh, but I just wanted to highlight that if we have uh, less than 95% participation rate uh, across any single test or across any different subgroup that we're looking at, um, we do get a little bit of a red flag. Uh, so there will be one of those. Uh, next slide, please. This reminder is going to come up a little later as we start to look at some data. This is the, the information that the state uses for um, pretty much categorizing if you've met target or exceeding target. So in a few of these slides, we'll see a little chart where there'll be threes and fours. Just to remind you, a three is meeting expectations and a four is exceeding. Uh, those two numbers play, play a role. And 75, 100% are the ones that tie to it. Uh, next slide. 
So as mentioned last time, of all the targets that the state put forth for us for this year, 89% success rate. So great job. We should feel really happy about that. I think that's a really, really good thing for all of us. Um, meeting exceeding really nice. Just next slide. Uh, this is where we lie relative to the other categorizations of schools. We have done really well. Short of the schools of recognition, we should be super proud from that accountability um, level. We've done well. Uh, next slide. And here's that recap. Um, really, really great job. The school accountability percentile, uh, we're doing well. So great job to the community, great job to the principals, great job to the teachers and all the staff. Really awesome. All right. So let's start to kind of transition into the next uh, couple things. Uh, one last little reminder, though. SGP, the student growth percentile, this turns up as well. Uh, you'll see numbers that range between 1 and 100. And each of the uh, 20% are roughly a little bucket. So if you have a growth of 1 to 19, very low. 80 to 99, very high. Uh, we'll see a lot of typical growth and high growth between that 40 and 79 throughout this. This just is a metric that is giving us a sense of how some of our cohorts are doing relative to other uh, similarly assessed and similarly achieved students across the state. Um, achievement advanced coursework in the academic river, rigor. I'm gonna use a couple of the data sources to just paint a little bit of a picture for some of the things that we're seeing across the board. Um, I mentioned a little while ago, next slide, that'll be good, uh, that we are seeing achievement and we are seeing students uh, enroll in high academic uh, rigorous courses. For our MCAS, just to kind of look at how we did across the board for three through five, uh, eight ELA, uh, the mean SGP is listed in one of the, the columns, the one in the middle, and the percent meter exceeding expectation, the two highest categories, are there for the percentages. The star is the state. So usually they try to get the mean SGP, the, the middle uh, growth, to be roughly 50%. Here it's 49.7. And you can pretty clearly see that across the board, our mean SGPs are all above in that typical growth, which is good news for us. Mm -hmm. The meaning exceeding uh, for this past year for three through eight, uh, aggregate of those two were 42%, and we're well in the 60s and 70% for that. So again, this is all great news. We're doing well with our MCAS achievement. Uh, you'll see something similar for math in the next slide. We're real well above what the state is doing. So again, great job. This is not a surprise considering our accountability data, but we've done well with these scores across the board. Um, one last slide for the MCAS achievement for math in LA. Uh, this is how we're doing for high school. Uh, if you look at the two stars, the bottom star is math. Uh, the blue circle is math. So the bottom star is relatively where we are uh, for both SGP and meeting exceeding expectations, and the blue little uh, dot is where the math is. Uh, the upper star is ELA, and the yellow star, is, the yellow uh, circle is where that is. So again, really well done. <coughs> Great job by us with the achievement. Science is a little trickier to, to use these same graphics, simply because of the fact that they don't have SGP. So just wanted to focus in on some of our focal groups. Um, high need status for uh, just a category encompasses three of our focal groups. It's students within EL, students within disability, and students who are um, uh, low income status. So those three groupings go into high needs. So this is the aggregate of those groupings and we can see just trends over the past few years. So for grade five science, it's been really nice growth. Uh, next slide. Similar for grade eight science, they've, scores are doing pretty well. Somewhat leveled out, but that's good through the pandemic. And the last slide. Oh, two more actually. Uh, this is our race, race ethnicity. We did have the other focal group of uh, students who identify as African American, Black, or Hispanic, Latinx. Uh, these are the trends uh, for those. So again, on upward trends. Next slide. Similar here. Uh, and then the next slide is where it gets a little wonky. Um, last year, 
no, two years ago, 2022, and then also 23, uh, they changed the nature of the science MCAS for grade nine. Uh, now it is split into grade nine physics and grade nine biology. There isn't that same information that we can go back to, uh, so we only have two years of data. Uh, but overall, they're doing well. The overwhelming majority of students, just for your, your knowledge, uh, sat for the physics uh, assessment, not the biology. Uh, overwhelming majority. If you go down to the next slide, uh, this is the race ethnicity for physics. Uh, next slide. Uh, for biology, it was so few, the only thing that we could actually measure is all students. Uh, there were no other categorizations. So for bio, over the two years, it's shown good growth, but this is on the scale of, I think, of roughly 15 kids who took this test, whereas every other ninth grader sat for the um, physics. All right. So, uh, quick reminder of the point scale. We see we're doing well on MCAS. We see we're doing well with the accountability data. Um, I want to paint a little bit of a different picture for the next couple slides, though. Um, to remind you, met target three, that's at 75%, and the four is essentially the exceeding target. Uh, next slide. So, the state puts forth different benchmarks for us to meet. This doesn't mean that every single focal group or subgroup that we're working with is scoring off the charts. What this means is for us, when we're thinking about uh, making progress, this information tells us that across the board, if you look at all students, non-high school, that first column, based on what the state has asked us to do, we are meeting or exceeding pretty much all of our targets, which again, we should be psyched about. But this doesn't paint the whole picture of what we want to look at. It just means that, you know, for students who might be students within disabilities, they wanted us to see a grow growth in a certain way, and we did that. Uh, can you go to the next slide? This is actually true also in our advanced coursework. Advanced coursework is a category that's been something that even in my prior role I've been monitoring. Um, the state defines a whole slew of courses. Some are AP courses, some are computer science, some are dual enrollment courses. Um, for math, it was anything that was past Algebra two, for the most part, can be considered an advanced course. Um, it's one of those things where tracking this as a metric is a nice way to see how we're doing across the board. And what's great about this is the state is essentially saying that across the board, even for some of our SOAP groups, we are meeting what they feel is, is appropriate growth for our students accessing advanced coursework. But it doesn't paint the whole picture. Uh, next slide. Uh, scroll a little more. I'll talk through the top columns. These columns essentially are representing the percentages of students who are completing the advanced coursework. So if we look at all students, it's roughly around 84% of students are completing by the time they graduate. <coughs> at least one course which the state defines it as, as advanced. But if you look at the subgroups that we might be focusing on, our students with an EL, it's only 28.6%. Our students who are um, identified with a dis learning disability, it's 55%. Uh, students who are low income, 59%. It's a much lower rate at which they're actually accessing these courses, and they usually tend to be in certain content areas. It's not as though it's across the board. So for our EL learners, as I'm going across that column, um, we're talking about 0% of our students who took an advanced course in ELA, 7.1% in, in science and technology. So we're seeing huge gaps. Even though we're meeting the benchmarks that the state's putting forth, we're seeing huge gaps in the courses that some of our students within our focal groups are actually <coughs> accessing. When we're thinking about success beyond, you know, we're thinking about college and career ready, but we're also thinking about ensuring that all of our students are accessing these advanced courses to put them in a position to go towards the careers and the professions that they'd want to be accessing. And right now, we are seeing some gaps in those areas. So, you know, the, just to start off the story, to recap it, we're doing well with our MCAS, we're doing well with our meeting our benchmarks, but we still have a little bit of work to do inside of, of getting some of our students uh, to feel as though they're welcome in our courses. I wanted to amplify this story a little bit with the next slide. 
Truth be told, the bulk of our advanced courses are AP courses. And we're seeing some interesting trends here across the board. Um, what I kind of zoomed in on here was the number of AP exams that students are actually taking, uh, which is an amazing amount of growth. Like we went from in 2019, 454 assessments <coughs> with 33% of the population, one out of every three students, to now, you know, five years later, 626, with a 41% of students taking at least one. I, I think the, the most uh, for any student who graduated last year was 18. Uh, they had 18 AP exams, uh, which was, was pretty intense, um, pretty intense. I think the typical student right now is, is enrolling and completing at least two, uh, which is, again, a pretty impressive trend. The one thing I do want to point out is, in spite of this unbelievable growth of kids going into our advanced courses and AP courses, our um, uh, percentage of three or above, you know, when you talk about MCAS, we usually talk about percent meeting exceeding. When you talk about APs, it's usually what's three or above. And the fact that we're still at 87%, whereas in 2019, we we're at 84.4%, uh, it's, students aren't just taking the classes, they're enrolling at an increasing rate, uh, and essentially, they're still scoring the same as they did before, which is great. But there's always a caveat. Can we go to the next slide? I wanted to understand where some of this growth was and if this growth was for all. One big area that's been changing over the past couple of years is we've seen an increased number of freshmen and sophomores enrolling in AP exams. Uh, that's been a pretty consistent trend. Mostly, it's, it's computer science. I actually have to take the blame in, as the, the prior math and CS director. Um, we have a lot of students who are coming in able to access some of our CS classes as freshmen, but there are other reasons as well. In spite of this growth, though, and this is the, another kind of, uh, I think, emphasis or another little place where, in spite of the fact that we have this growth, we only have a total of 11 students who identify as black who sat for an AP exam. They took a bunch of tests, but it was the same 11 students, and our population of students who identify as black is much greater. Hispanic and Latino, it's the total of 42. Um, for some of our students in these focal groups, they're not accessing the courses at the same rate, and actually at quite a lower rate. <coughs> we see a little more of that in the next slide. So these are the scores, these are the percentages. Those 11 students who identified as black took 21 tests. So they actually are doing, the, they're, they're, those students are, the typical Arlington student who are taking two AP courses, their average score is a little bit lower, still above the three, which is great. Um, and those 40-something or so students <coughs> who identify as Hispanic or Latino um, took 95 uh, assessments. So again, we're seeing unbelievable enrollment. Kids are going for advanced classes, but not at the same rate uh, across all of our focal groups. All right. So, what I was curious about after this was, do the kids actually feel as though these courses are rigorous, hard? Like, how are they actually feeling about this? This data is telling us where they're going. I'm curious now for myself, like, how are they actually feeling? So the next slide, Ms. Diggins. For our grade three through five students, based on our panorama results, there's a pretty big increase across the board with how they feel their experience in class has been. The lion's share of this growth, and I think this is a testament to some of the goals that were uh, put in place last year by our principals, uh, the lion's share of this was in creating more student voice within our elementary classrooms. Some of the goals that focused around academic discourse, some of the goals that focused on uh, student engagement, uh, these were areas of growth in our panorama survey which impacted this domain of um, rigorous expectations. So we're talking roughly around 80% of our, 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 the bulk of our students feeling as though it's, it's fairly rigorous. Uh, next slide. For our students in six through 12, they're feeling the same thing. Not that same huge growth, but they were starting at a higher um, uh, benchmark as is, but they're pretty much saying that our courses are, are fairly rigorous. All right. So, the next question that popped in my mind was, if students feel as though our courses are rigorous, if students are enrolling a lot of these courses at a higher rate, and we still are seeing gaps in some of our focal groups, what could be some of the reasons why 
those students aren't engaging at the same rate. Uh, and that's where we start to look at some other data sources. This was an interesting trend that I didn't totally expect. Although students feel as though our courses are more difficult, they're more rigorous, we're seeing a pretty consistent downward trend of a sense of belonging in our school community. It's not huge. It wasn't something when I looked at this, I was like, oh man, this is a huge, huge issue. But it was surprising that that's going down a little bit in, in three through five. So was that the same through six through 12? Uh, can we go to the next slide? Levels off a little bit here, but even those percentages are much lower than the 67%. Like we're starting from a much lower area. So one of the things that was cu of curiosity of mine is that our students are here, they're taking hard classes. Uh, some students aren't at the same rate, but overall we don't have that same sense of belonging. So then I kind of tried to dig a little bit deeper into that to understand some of the causes there. Can we go to the next slide? And what started to kind of pop up was some mental health concerns in some of our focal groups. And these aren't so surprising. I left the first one in there. Ninth graders feel a lot more comfortable and good about their time. But once we get to 11th grade, some of our mental health metrics kind of go off the charts. Students who are female and gender diverse, they're significantly more likely to report mental health was not good most of the time, or always, uh, which is amazing. LGBTQIA+, were significantly more likely to report that their mental health was not good sometimes, most of the times, or always. And the one that actually, I, I highlighted down below, students who are Hispanic and Latino, more likely to report that mental health was not good sometimes, most of the times, or always. So it was intriguing to me, or interesting to me, that belonging across the board, we, we're, we're seeing academic success, but belonging across the board for some of our focal groups, as well as their mental health um, assessment uh, information is, is pinging as a little bit of a red flag for us. Can we go to the next slide? I was curious then about the absenteeism. Like are our students actually getting to school? This has been something that's been a little bit of a red flag the past couple of years. The state did set some guidelines for us and some benchmarks and we met them. We're at three and fours, which is great. Uh, but that's only based on how they felt we should be doing. It doesn't mean that we're necessarily doing well. So I went back to some more information. Can we go to the next slide? Um, and sure enough, what I kind of looked at here is for all students, top left, 95% roughly, um, they're coming to school 95% of the time. If you kind of scroll over, um, Liz, can I just trouble you to kind of put it down a little bit? I just want to be able to see the top columns just so I explain them. Thank you. That's perfect. The state defines chronic absenteeism as 10% uh, or more. They made a little leeways during the pandemic to talk about 20% or more, so they left that on there as well. So one of the things I just kind of wanted to point out is this. So although the attendance rate is pretty good, as we start to move to the right and look at, let's say, students who are identified as low income, chronically absent 10% of the time, that 25.2 is a percentage. So one-fourth of our students who are within low income are absent 10% of the time. To put that into context, over a two-week period, those students are absent one day. Every two weeks, one day. Every two weeks, one day. If you scroll over to the 20%, the 20% or more low income, 5% of those students, one in 20, are absent one day a week for the whole year. So it's one of those things where when we're looking at this a little bit, although we are improving and although we are doing better with meeting the needs of our, some of our students who are struggling, there still is some red flags in our chronic absenteeism. If we look across the board at those chronic absentee students, um, it does align closely with our students within our focal groups. So when I'm looking at this, what I'm seeing essentially is for some of our students in our focal groups, they're not engaging at the same rate in our advanced courses. Uh, they're chronically absent at a much higher rate, and they're showing some other mental health um, concerns that we might want to focus on. Uh, next slide. We're going to pivot a little bit. That's kind of the end of that little part of the narrative, just in terms of our students. So a lot of positives with our academic success. It's great to see students enrolling in such hard courses, but we do have some areas of growth. We do. 
So the next little part, this motivates some of our initiatives that we have right now. I just wanted to make sure that folks know, like we do have a pilot of, of a new curriculum in elementary school for um, ELA. Um, and just wanted to kind of look at some of the trends. Uh, <coughs> uh, high need status. Uh, little things that I wanted to kind of point out with this is for some of these graphs, you could still see a pretty big graph, uh, pretty big gap. Uh, and for some of them, they're either stable or they are uh, going in the negative direction. So for our high needs, um, those students who are identified as high needs, again, those are students who are within EL. They're students who are identified as low income uh, and students with disabilities. That trend is going down for our grade three through five students. Uh, next slide. For our students with the, who are identified as black uh, or Hispanic Latino, the trends have been going down. Uh, next slide. For our EL status, same thing. Um, okay, next slide. I included this, the grades six through eight, simply because of the fact that for through the pandemic, I just wanted to get a sense like where students were in, in, uh, in elementary school to here. Uh, the gap is still wide, but it levels out a little bit. Um, <coughs> uh, for students who are high needs and, and non-high needs, this might warrant a little bit of uh, focus as we get into the middle school grades for EL. Um, the last slide for this is over the past few years, there's been uh, a few more assessments implemented at the lower grades. Um, I liked this just because of the fact that Right now, the current third graders. I know this uh, well because my son is in third grade. The current third graders were those students who were in preschool or were just shy of entering the K uh, public school when the pandemic started. So right now, this was of interest to me because it's looking at a lot of the students who may have had a few years in those early years uh, leading in. Uh, to give you a sense of what these mean, K, grade one, grade two, that makes sense. BOY is beginning of year. MOI is middle of year, and EOI is end of the year. So the Dibbles assessment, the eighth edition, was administered three times last year for K, uh, one, two, and three. Some of our fourth and fifth grade students use it as a pilot, uh, but not enough to really warrant. Um, I did want to point out that it's great to actually see the progress that was made in each grade throughout the year. It's fantastic. But also wanted to highlight, there's still work to do. Because if you look at grade three, uh, end of year, that's still roughly 20% of our students who still didn't meet benchmark. So it's one of those things that based on, on this assessment, you know, we've seen the, the ELA trends, it still warrants a little bit of focus at the e elementary level for uh, those initiatives that have been put forth for ELA. There's still some work to do there as well. Okay. And one little, little thing, you're going to see a lot of these recurring themes throughout the set. So one of the things I've been working on is making sure that a lot of these data displays are pretty consistent throughout. So you'll be able to you know, go back to this as a reference uh, and then you can actually see district-wide, you can see what some of the schools are doing, uh, how the, the trends are going throughout. So the whole goal is to create a through line and also create some consistencies with them. So I try to put graphics in here that are gonna be translatable to all and each of the schools as they move uh, forward. And that's where the next steps come in. Um, Go on to the one last slide, and this will be it. Thank you for your help, Liz. Um, these are the things that are pretty much recurring themes in a lot of the SIPs. Um, EL pilot at K through five elementary literacy. Every elementary school has at least two grades, I think it's two grades, who are piloting uh, the new EL curriculum. There's a lot of support, there's a lot of PD, uh, there's a lot going towards uh, that um, initiative, which is great, so you'll see a recurring theme there. You're gonna see goals centered on welcoming and sense of belonging, starting at the family level. Like if we want our students to feel welcome, we probably have to do a better job overall as a community to get more families feeling uh, part of it. So the welcome center is gonna be a big initiative. The resource hub, uh, the increased parental communication and engagement. Um, I think there's been some great things that have been done so far. Uh, Rob mentioned the working groups uh, that are happening with the strategic initiatives. Across the board, across the, the district, there are these working groups that are specifically designed to look at and start to um, better understand uh, the sense of belonging, the instructional vision, uh, 
MTSS and also our other student supports. Um, the coordinated school improvement plans, ho uh, hopefully I can be a help there. Uh, and then the last one is focus on the uh, deeper learning academic rigor, rigor, including that discourse and student voice. That was something that started last year across a lot of schools, and you'll see the continuation of that. Embedded in all of this, embedded in all of these, and I really wanted to kind of end with this, is the idea of equity. Like we still have to go back to that mission where it's equitable access for all. And right now, like just having this painted picture, we feel, I feel as though we are doing a great job. We should pat ourselves on the back, but we still have work to do to ensure that a lot of our students within those focal groups are, are able to access those same opportunities. So that theme is gonna be recurring in all of these initiatives um, that we're, we're, we're moving forward. Thank you very much. Um, before I ask for questions, I wondered if Dr. Ford Bucker has anything to yeah. add. Thank you. So the fast. only thing that I'll add in is uh, what Matt mentioned, which is we're really trying hard to make sure that the school improvement plans are really reflective of um, ways in which schools are going to respond to the data that you just uh, got a deeper dive into. And so we're really trying hard to make sure that action steps are aligned and that schools are receiving resources that they've identified as needing to help make sure that we're responding to um, what Matt just shared, particularly as it relates to meeting the needs of all of our focal groups. So I'll just end there and then ask if there are any questions that folks have. Okay, great. Any questions, Ms. Morgan? Um, so I'm gonna start back like at the bottom and then work my way back. So yeah. <clears throat> the first question I had um, about the the Dibbles, which is in here. So my understanding is, and this is probably a question for Dr. Ford Walker, is that we're now required to notify families, right? If their students are in um, within like 30 days of the assessment, which color is the group that we have to notify? The blues or the blues and the, I mean, clearly the blues, is it the blues and the reds? So it's or, a well below group, so it would be the blues. It's the blues, yeah. okay, all right. Um, and those, and, and they, will they be notified if we do this three times a year, there'll be a series of three notification? Yes. Okay. Yes, we have 30 days after the screening to provide notice to families. Okay, yeah. all right, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, I guess I had a question. So Matt, it looks like to me in these, um, in these ELA, it, it, it doesn't, I mean, because you, you took us all the way back to 2019, which I, I appreciate, I think is, yeah. is I, think it's, I think it's very honest, right? Um, you know, the, these gaps are, are bigger now than they were in 2019, right? Between the high needs and the, so I, I think, you know, that's, um, they're, not, they're not closing. Yep. They're, they've, they've gotten bigger and they've actually, so I guess, with what you know about this achievement date, like they've gotten actually bigger since 2021, yep. right? And I guess, but like, do we know anything about what happened in 2021 that explains that? I mean, they took a, a different, they yeah. took a, a shorter test, right? Was yeah, that the year they took the, they took the half? The yeah, half they piece? did. Yeah, yeah, it was not a full, uh, comprehensive ass assessment. So the reason why we go back to the 2019 is it's echoing what the state's even doing, which is looking at 2019 against 2022, how are you doing, and then resetting yourself. So it was important to me to kind of just echo that same story with the median exceeding. Um, but yeah, you're right. I mean, 2021, it was a little bit of a bump uh, across the board. <coughs> but it was maybe not apples to oranges. They had a little, do a little bit of hand waving to get everything to match up. My more concern is over the past couple of years. Yeah, me too. Especially yeah. grades six through eight that in the ELA that like not, we're not, it's not going in the right No, direction. it's been pretty level for a while. I mean, it's, it's a little bit of a downward trend. It's been a pretty big gap, uh, fairly level. Yeah, okay. Um, I really appreciate the attendance data. I think that's, really helpful and I've never seen it presented like this before. So that's um, really helpful uh, for me and I think it provides an important um, sort of, you know, 
threes and fours look great, go us. They do, but then right. when you look at it and you think about how much how you know how much school some of these these students are missing um, and how impactful that can be um, both to them but also to their their teachers and to their you know the people who are trying to support them um, so and I think that was all of my questions I'll come back if I have any more but oh oh I did have a question okay so when we go back to slide 23 Liz um, so the 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 kids so most kids take physics right they take physics in ninth grade and then they take the physics MCAS and then they're like done yep. with with ninth grade MCAS so what about these these biology are these ninth graders who took biology that's a good or, question I, I think they're tenth graders who still need to pass the science MCAS um, or no, am I wrong about I that? I don't believe that's true. Okay. I'll ask Dr. Hoyo about that. Um, okay. Yeah, let me ask her. I don't want to misspeak. Uh, let me okay. ask her. Yeah, I'm but just But it was curious. very, very few students. Okay. And then what do we, so what do we do, and maybe this is a question for Dr. Ford Walker, with the this 33% who need that science MCAS? requirement like so some of them didn't meet or exceed right like 33 percent of the them did score is lower than that it's what the cut score isn't at meet meet it's right? not at yeah. meet okay yeah so the the ones that um uh, yeah the the competency determination uh is it's you still have the not meeting part uh but the oh, i'm sorry partially meeting uh you don't have to worry too much about the partially meeting because the state doesn't mandate what's called an EPP for that. Okay. And even though you're partially meeting, you've still kind of met the competency determination. Got it. Whereas okay. for math and ELA, it's a little bit different. If you're within partially meeting, um, within even a sub-strand of that, it's like these weird, you know, uh, 471 to 485, uh, even within that, they'll uh, ask the schools to uh, support those students with an education proficiency plan. Uh, it. But it's a little bit different for science. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Okay, Ms. Gittleman. I just I just had one question, um, which was on the AP section, yeah. is it possible to break that data out by income level? Because that's one place where it seems to me like income yeah. level has, in terms of accessing, yeah. I would just be curious to see where what, I could definitely what those differences are. Yeah. Okay. And as long as I'm down at that end of the table, do our AHS representatives have questions? Good. Keep her to. So we heard from Ms. Visco a couple weeks ago about the dental health survey that just went out, and now with this, is there like you were discussing that the there's working groups for um, like the sense of belonging and equity, but I was wondering what else like there's like addressed for specifically like mental health among like the groups that you said were lower than all the others? So I'll, I'll, the working groups uh, that are the um, administrator-based groupings, uh, right now it's in the infancy. Right now it is the start. Uh, myself and Ms. Elmer are co-chairing one of the working groups. So we're really um, just even establishing what we're gonna focus on. So I don't want to misspeak about what any of those groups will be focusing on, but I can confidently say that Ms. Olander, um, who is our director of SEL, um, is working her tail off to think about and understand and to put in some initiatives that will be there for, to support all of our students. Allison, so, Allison do you want to talk yeah. a little bit about what Mogali's work is in terms of this mental health? So she's the director, you've met her last year, she's the director of um, <laughs> counseling and <laughs> SEL um, she met with you to talk about some of the initiatives that they have across the district um, I don't know if you're looking for specifics um, no, I, I know, think the mental health right it's her question, right, it's her question. Right. Yeah. yep yeah. and the mental so you participated in mental health screeners at the high school level and um, for students who do get flagged on those there's follow-up either individual or there are um, group follow-up is one of the uh, measures that has been in place um, I think when you talk about SEL and you're talking about social emotional learning, um, as far as a 
content area, that's where the work of that department is, um, and looking particularly at the elementary grades to make sure that we're embedding that in instruction and in our academic areas just as much as math and ELA like that. Um, I think that there are, we have increased mental health um, providers across the district. It's one of our, I don't know, Dr. or Mr. Spiegel can speak to the number of staff that we've hired in that department and have been continuing to increase that. So that's some of the things. But um, it's not a specific subset of the strategic plan which everyone is referencing with these working groups. However, MTSS, the group that Mr. Coleman and I are part of, is you look at academic, social, emotional, and behavioral in that. So under that umbrella, work will be done there through the strategic plan. Yeah, thank you. Do you have any follow-up questions? No? And the only thing that I'll add in is that our Director of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, Justice, and Belonging, Margaret Cradle Thomas, is looking at ways to connect with students, particularly at the high school, to find, a little, find out a little bit more about how we can do better as adults in the district to support um, some of the needs as it relates to mental health. And so I know she's looking at how to actually get that information directly from students in a way where students feel open and free and honest to share it and not feel as though the information will be used um, in some way that will like expose them or something. Um, and so if you have ideas around that, I would offer you uh, to contact someone at your school or even reach out to me. Um, I know we're don't necessarily know one another yet, but find someone who is a trusted adult that you can share that information with and hopefully they'll bring it to us so that we can figure out how to do better. Cool, thank you. Yeah. Great. Ms. Exton. Thank you. Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, thank you for the presentation. This has been really comprehensive and very clear. I feel like I understood all of the parts. Um, after at my what, fourth <laughs> um, outcomes report. Um, I, uh, um, I don't want to repeat too much about what other people have said, but I did appreciate the context around the absenteeism and sort of highlighting what that actually means in terms of one day every two weeks or a day a week. I mean, that, that's significant, um, and that stands out a lot to me. Um, I mostly wanted to comment on the elementary ELA. Um, I... The third grade uh, sort of stands out to me, and I, I, I hear what you're saying about the, um, the pandemic, but if we're looking at just grade three from the beginning of the year to the end of the year, we're actually not, we're actually seeing a decrease in students at or above, and so that sort of makes me think about, um, you know, our, the tier one instruction there for students in that particular grade level. Um, and so, you know, I know we're making changes, but the Dibbles also really focuses more on um, the phonics even and, and decoding and vocabulary even in grade three. So I, I'm wondering, I guess, what, um, if we're including <coughs> the foundations and the Hegarty into grade three also, like how are we maintaining that word study work as we go up the grades is one of my questions. Um, and then more of a comment than a question is, it would be helpful maybe next year when you do this, Mr. Coleman, um, or whoever does it, um, to have the longitudinal data of this, similar to how you have the MCAS, in the sense that um, the third graders on this Dibbles chart were in kindergarten when the pandemic mm -hmm. started. Yep. And so what, what would that grade, what that, would that cohort look like from K to three versus you know, our current first graders who have had much less of an experience of missing school, masks, things like that, so. I don't think we had the Dibbles to do that type the of analysis. The full composite, so you wouldn't be able to compare right. apples. So I, yeah, I, I agree with you. I always liked the longitudinal better, but it wasn't something we had available. Okay, so this is the first, so last year was the first time that you did the composite. So yeah, to get the full composite scores on all of them, that that we just implemented that last year, and okay. they only started implementing it at third grade also last year. Last year, okay. So, um, so that was one of my questions and comments. And then the other um, is a follow up to Miss Morgan. Um, well, it might be a the requirement might be that we share information um, just for students um, who are scoring well below. I'm wondering if there's been any conversation around 
sort of best practice around reporting all of the scores or below and well below. Um, so how that gets yeah, shared, shared with, families. with families. Yeah, I, I think that that's a great question and we need to explore how that is happening um, so that all lines of communication are open and that so families are aware of um, how their children are performing and achieving. Because, you know, the difference between below and well below yeah. is one yeah. number. So, thank okay. you. Just that to day. add that they will be getting it with the progress reports, the regular progress reporting time period. So folks who are flagged will get it within the 30-day notice, but everybody will get their results when we send out um, the first, whatever the progress reporting period is. So for third, for elementary, it's three times a year. So okay, so it. every student will have their they're, yes, they're report gonna send those home. at when they get their progress reports. Uh, I just want to make sure I'm understanding your question. Are, you're saying that every student who uh, gets tested using Dibbles, you're asking about information being shared with their families about performance so three the, times per year. Right, so the right. new legislation is that, what, from what I'm well understanding below. from you, is that the well below must, yes. must be informed. Yes. And I'm asking if perhaps best practice might be different than what the law requires and what Arlington is planning to do. For all students, not just for the well below. Correct. Yeah. Okay. I, I think, if I understand correctly, um, is she's wondering, instead of just telling the people whose students scored well below, maybe we want to inform the people whose students scored below and, and well, well below. or well below. I see. Right. Okay. If it's below and well just below. that okay. they're so, or, you know, what, what's, where's the cutoff mm -hmm. that it's good to inform? And then, I'll just well, then, wait, what on. is Ms. Elmer saying is going to go, like, is, is even a kid who's in the 80th percentile, is it going to be on their progress report or no? The document is to go home, but I can follow up. Okay. So, just as, as, a, yeah. that. as a future yes. agenda item, <laughs> yes. we have, no, we have new, there are new regulations that went into effect July 1st, 2023 mm -hmm. okay. on literacy screening. We should get a presentation on how we're implementing that. What do the notices look like? Samples of the notices that are going to families. What this issue of who's getting the results and when. Um, and, you know, there's an opportunity to have a conversation. If you're in the well below, we have to provide an opportunity to have a conversation. How are we accommodating those? Who's attending those conversations? How have we set this up? How are we complying with these new regulations? Sure. Okay. Can you send me an sure. email just yeah. with all of that so I can make sure that it, it gets into one? Okay, good. Thank you. Um, okay. And um, I, I just will add that there's a district notice going out tomorrow about this. Okay. Um, that notice will still go out <laughs> just so that families are informed of what the process is as of today so that um, the letters that schools have, there are some schools that have sent some letters out already notifying families of this process and the district letter is just to make sure everyone is aware of the information. Um, so that notice will continue to go out. I do think uh, the presentation that you're asking for um, uh, makes sense, especially because this is a new process for people. And I think if there are ways for us to update uh, what's going to be sent out tomorrow in a way that better meets the needs of families, then we'll do that. Absolutely. I think. Okay, just to tag on to, because we're in this topic, I guess my other question along the same lines is, are we just sending out the scores? Or are we sending out the scores and resources for the parents or recommendations of what they, you know, are we just dumping yeah. them with the problem? Or are we giving them some tools to help or, or at least telling them that we're doing everything we can? But I mean, if I was a parent who got this letter and that's all, <coughs> I'd be like, well, what do I do? So, um, okay, I think we've, we're gonna talk about this more later. Um, everyone's, Mr. Schlepper. And Mr. Hewman. Can I get this over? <laughs> yeah, I didn't go yet. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I do have oh, an answer for that. Oh, so okay. there's a, um, a Home Connect form that mm -hmm. goes out uh, in addition to the letter, and it helps the family understand uh, the particular skills that a student was tested in and how they, um, what their achievement score was. And within the letter, there are also resources um, attached to it for families to follow up um, on in terms of meeting their child's needs. Um, and that could be a resource that's in the actual letter, but also schools are following up through phone calls, through emails, in order to help families 
um, un better understand how to use the resource that they're getting Great. along with the Home Connect letter. Great, so awesome, thank you. Okay. okay. Do you want to go first? Doesn't matter. No. <coughs> go first. Paul, Paul, Paul's going to have better questions than I am. So, um, <clears throat> I mean that a good way. My uh, so thanks very much. This is you know very comprehensive, clear, transparent, and I I, I appreciate how this is uh, presented to us. It's it's uh, thank you. It's a step in the right. It's a good step in the right direction. Um, very good step in the right direction. My question: the SGP. Yeah. Do we have trends for that anywhere? Do I? Um, we can get, uh, are you, that one's a tough one. Yes, it, but yeah, I'm, what are you looking for specifically? Like how we've been over the past several years, like in. <clears throat> do you, I mean, the, the reason why I'm hesitating is you want to look at the mean of how you're doing over the past couple of years or. Yeah, like mean 10th grade, mean yeah. 11th grade. I know you're not, yeah, I don't, I don't know if that exists. Yeah. It is, they give the category, categories, and what I'm curious is you can look at it based on cohort, like how yeah. this cohort did with their growth over those few years. You can look yeah. at it as the mean. You can look at it as the grade level. Um, I'm more curious, like, what would be of interest to you? How, the, how they did in ninth grade, 10th grade, 11th grade, 12th grade, like yeah. that, that same group. <laughs> I don't even know if that's possible. Sure. I mean, yeah, yeah you don't seem to be that excited. No, about no, it. no, no. <laughs> it's, it's, I'm actually fighting back a cough right Oh, now. okay. Um, uh, I, I talked really fast because I was so worried yeah. about coughing. Uh, so it's one of those things that it's not, that one's not the hardest one to generate. That's, that's an okay one to do. Okay. Um, I think I'm just, uh, with all the sips and everything, I mean, is it okay to get it in like? I'm not, I'm not asking yeah. for it tonight. I'm not, I mean, I'm giving you a deadline. I just want to know. It's up to, I mean, yeah, yeah. I'm just throwing it out there as, yeah, yeah. is something that I just would be curious about grade by grade. Yep. Yeah, what, how each group is doing. You know, are they, is, it the, is it consistently 50% for, you know? We've done well with growth over the past couple yeah. of years mm -hmm. uh, as, as a, yeah. a metric. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. I mean, one, one thing that did jump out at me was the high school, it was slide 17, the high school, uh, yes, 16 or 17, I guess it is. The, the high school ELA was a 50 for 10th graders, was a, SGP was 50, and the state ELA was 49.5. <coughs> then math was 58, and the state math was 49.6. So I just, I thought the ELA would be higher. I don't know why. I'm biased. You're talking to the wrong person. I know I am. Yeah. Uh, no, yeah. I'm looking at you uh, saying, why did I say that? But I said it. So, like, what do you, do you have, does anyone, do you have any thoughts on that? I, I don't. I mean, I, when I presented last year with my prior role, um, this isn't, the math teachers are a hardworking group. Like, they've done a really <laughs> good job. I mean, uh, all the teachers are, but I know them well, and they've, yeah, they, yeah. Uh, I don't know if Mr. Coleman is uh, the person who can speak to the no. ELA growth. <laughs> I'm not, I, yeah, I, I just did. Yeah. 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 I'll try I mean, to jump did. in and yeah. say that, I think that that's a, that's a interesting data point and yeah. we need to do mm -hmm. a little bit more research yeah. to find out yeah. why that data point is the way it is. I, I agree, mm. yeah. there needs to be a little more depth. We need to figure it out. You need a deeper dive into it. Yeah. And that's what I'm kind of hoping yeah. to provoke. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like, uh, I'm sure you're talking about all the data all the time, yeah. but I'm just curious. You know, has there been any discussion about this data point? Um, at the high school, yes, yeah. but I don't think that there has been um, a final kind of thought around what the cause is behind the reason why the data is not a little bit more better. Can I comment? Oh my God, Please. I was just speaking. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, so, um, so I think, I think it's, it's worth noting that an SGP of 50 is typical growth, growth. Um, and it's also worth noting that if you look at math trajectories through the whole district, K through 12, we see improvement in math. We've done a lot of work in math to invest in coaching at the elementary level over the last many years, um, to have yeah. school level coaching at the elementary level. Uh, we've done a lot of work that I think has resulted in improvements in math at the secondary level. And so if you're looking at SGP for 10th graders right now, given the pandemic, everything we've done in the past, and the fact that we have very stable gaps, if not increasing gaps in ELA in other parts of the system, increasing at the elementary level, stable at the middle level, but some of what you're gonna see at the high school level is the fact that all of those students are students who have gone through that system with those curricula, uh, with those gaps, at either stabilizing, improving through middle school um, levels. So 
I would say that's a reflection as much of 10th grade ELA as it is of the system, and would also point out that an SGP of 50 is typical growth. I, I, I know it's typical growth, but I saw the math difference, and so I wanted to point it out. Mm -hmm. I didn't know it would go in this direction. Um, I did, and you know, the other thing I did, in our, our student representative already brought this up, so I didn't uh, talk about this too much, but in slide, it was slide 36 did catch my eye in the pre-read, which was, I want to make sure I get the students in ninth grade were less likely than the average high school student to report their mental health was not good sometimes, most of the time, or always, while students in 11th grade were significantly more likely than the average high school student, presumably, to report this sort of thing. So that is, I mean, that is an interesting trend. Yeah. yeah. Is it high school students average in the whole world or our students? Our students. So ninth graders are less likely than our AHS yes. student population. Are they, oh, that's what it is. So, so that's, it's not, oh, it's it's not, not, it's not, not a comparison. Yeah, no, no, to two, two hours. Oh, no, it's not compared to the whole world. Okay. I, 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 didn't, I didn't think the whole world, but yeah. Yeah, no. <laughs> okay. I thought maybe a, uh, okay. Thank you. That clarified that. I don't have any other questions. Okay. Mr. Schlickman. Okay, uh, that growth makes me want to talk about it. Okay. Oh. Okay, but before I go, before I go there, I have one cohort that I'm vitally interested in that we're not looking at right now. Okay. That that has cried out to me uh, is for because you can get a hint at that looking at the accountability data for the high school. It, because they report out for kids who are in the four-year and five-year cohort. And by doing a little subtraction, you can see the kids who are being reported but aren't within that cohort, which means that they weren't in the high school on their first day of ninth grade. There's a substantive difference there. So that when I'm looking at kids who are taking five years to graduate or, or some of the other markers of kids who need more from our school system in order to, to succeed, that looks like a disproportionate transfer in cohort. Yeah, could be. And I'd sort of, and I'd like to so, sort of have us thinking about that as a cohort of students we identify and look out for. If your analysis of the data confirms my hypothesis based on what I can see from the public data. Okay. Okay. Now, <coughs> growth, uh, oh, school improvement plans. I just want to make sure, I want to lay it out here because I'm, I, I, read, I have read more school improvement plans than almost anybody in the state because I was responsible for reading about two dozen of them, more than two dozen of them every year for 20 years. So it's, just, you know, I, uh, in, in a high stakes district lull, where, where it really is a high stakes thing in the states, looking over your shoulder and looking for under, underperforming schools. None of our schools here are underperforming or even close to it, so that there's a lot less stress and pressure behind the school improvement plan, so there, there's less of a sense of urgency and more of a sense of being in that growth mindset. So it's, just, it, 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 it's, it's a whole nother operation, and I'm acknowledging that. But when I'm looking at a school improvement report, I just want to f sketch out right now so we're, we're clear that when they're coming through, I, I sort of want to see a continuum between the data being presented, the action steps, and, and a desired outcome or a goal based on it. I, I want to see those tied together. I don't want to see things coming out out of left field in any of those three categories. Okay. I want to be able to see that logical trend and, and see that consistency. The high school's done a wonderful job of this. I think they've had the best school improvement plans that I, in the past couple of years. Um, growth numbers. I'm going to give my little quick lesson on student growth okay. uh, is that for students, there are those five categories of very low, low, typical, high, and very high. But that's a percentile score, so every one of those numbers is a place in a distribution. Yep. So for every year, every test, it's a distribution, and uh, there's an equal probability of a student being at 20 and a student being at 80 yep. across the board. It's a flat distribution. However, when you're looking at schools, 
you are now getting a distribution of this, this data, so you the distribution of means, which means that you've got a, a, a standard distribution that looks like this, and by definition, that mean of this, uh, the mean of the means is going to be at 50, but the standard deviation, depending on what, whether you're looking at district or school uh, math or ELA, is somewhere is in the five to seven range. So basically, if you're over 60 as a school or a district in your SG, mean G, SGP, you're, you're two, de two standard deviations above the mean, which means that that's extraordinary versus being just sort of above uh, average growth if that number was tied to a kid. So that distinction, I, I want it clear to everyone that when we're taking a look at the Odyssey numbers and their numbers are in, in that 60 range, is that's not sort of mediocre. Well, they're doing a little better than, 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 than expectation. They're, they're, the tail of the distribution, they're doing extraordinarily well in the growth. Uh, so that, that's, that's sort of one of my pet peeves because nobody understands in any presentation I see from the state, the, the, you know, all these state data is not, is saying, well, the state number is 50. Well, it has to be 50. And that there's no expectation that a school is going to be in 80, 90, or 100. You'll see the distribution is really crowded around here so that that x-axis when you're putting the uh, growth numbers on the x-axis should be tightened up to really focus in the 40 to 60 range because that's where schools are going to going to be popping in so i i'm concerned when schools are at 45 which seem like normal growth for a kid it is i'm really ecstatic if i'm seeing 55. Uh, so that's just sort of my uh, presentation bias and I think that we really want to emphasize that when those numbers show up in the 50s, it's not mediocre, it's, it, 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 well in the 50s is really pretty good. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, when I first started doing this job in law, I had my boss who was always squawking about the colors I used in my uh, presentations. Uh, the one thing I'd like just for peace, love, and harmony in my eyes, is that when we're doing the graphs is sort of try to do a continuum of colors. So when we did the dibbles, you went from blue to ye red to yellow to green. It's sort of like sort of a more red, yellow, green, blue, or something of a continuum, which yep. helps to identify what's going on. But if, if that's my biggest complaint on this presentation, it's spectacular. I think that there's a lot of really good information here. Um, and I, I hope that the people who are watching this, because, you know, there's nobody behind you in the, in the room, but a lot of people sit here and watch this on TV. I, I hope that people are understanding, one, just how well we're doing as a district right now, and two, just how committed we are to doing analysis of what's going on and building on strengths and becoming even better. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So now it's my turn. Um, like Mr. Schuckman, I wanted to make a, st a statement first. Just I'm looping back to slide four, slide four, which is where you did the quick reminder of focal groups. And um, because of a, a discussion I had had with a community member in the past couple weeks, I had talked to our superintendent. And I just want to point out for our audience at home, our millions of viewers, that um, it's important to understand that the district is tracking and monitoring lots of groups, many more than these focal groups. It's not, we're not just looking at five groups and ignoring everybody else. Mm -hmm. It's just, these are the groups where the uh, concerns about attendance, ex school experience and stuff also um, relate to academic achievement and specifically they're having academic achievement which is below the rest <coughs> of the students so I just want to be clear that if a um, family has a student who doesn't fall to one of those focal groups it doesn't mean that they're not being 
looked at and, and being assessed, for example, um, our Asian students are, can show up as having problems with some of their school experiences or belonging, but they're not showing the same problems with um, achievement. And so that's why they're not in a focal group. So that's one thing. Um, the second thing is for slide 12 under monotony preschool, it says insufficient data. We don't, nobody tests preschoolers, right? Okay, so, so it's like, yeah. it's not just insufficient data, it's like we don't do that. Okay. Can I say why I left that on there? Is that how the state? That's how the state works. I'm always guilty of this too. Like I always forget about monotony. It's a school within our district. So yeah, I, I know, sure it's it just honored. insufficient data makes it sound like we should be testing them, but we didn't, or, or some, to me, it's like, yeah, they're not tested, they're preschool. Um, and then finally, um, actually, Liz, can you pull up slide, uh, I don't know, 18? Okay, well, while Liz is doing this, I'll, I'll just talk through my concern. I just wanted to point out that slide 18, 19, 20, well, not some, yeah, 20 to 20 also, all of these show achievement gaps, right? We're seeing disproportionate differences between and, and lower achievement in different groups, um, and I think I think it was mentioned a little bit, but I think it wasn't, I, I want to be sure our audience at home understands uh, because right now we do, we are doing a big work trying to put through the override so that we can address, better address these type of achievement gaps and get our kids so that they're all just one little line with dots all, you know, all the different colored dots on the same, in the same spot. Um, and, sorry, let me find my other question. Okay. Um, I'll just skip to one. Uh, then just talking about the absenteeism, and this may be a Dr. Ford Walker, I'm not sure, um, is there, what do we do to find out why these kids are absent? You know, are they actually sick? Are their parents sick? Is, is, are they not able to get to school? Or, you know, what's, what's happening? What do we do? Yeah, I, I mean, I have ideas in terms of how we can do that moving forward. I do want to invite anyone else, I mean, you know, the other administrators in the room to talk to how it's been done in the past. And Liz, maybe you can help out with this as well. But I have ideas around how we can find out some answers moving forward. Do you all have anything? Okay, Liz, do you have anything? Yeah, I can jump in. Okay. Um, for the schools that have had a pretty significant impact on chronic absenteeism, the easiest answer is relentlessness. Um, that when a student is absent, that, we, that they track the trends, that they keep track of when a student's absent, they follow up with the family to inquire about why, um, that you know, we do things like home visits, we show up to the home to talk about what the challenges are to getting to school, uh, and we work to address it and to emphasize the importance of schooling. And that where we don't do those things, we don't see a decrease in chronic absenteeism. Now that's been incredibly difficult for folks to do over the past couple years because chronic absenteeism skyrocketed during the pandemic and immediately afterwards. So it was at its sort of all-time worst, I would say, last year and the year before, and has started to slowly decline. Um, and so it's going to be easier for us to use some of those shining examples with other schools to say, here are some of the things that work to decrease chronic absenteeism now that you don't have such an extreme onslaught of chronically absent students. And I'm sure, um, I know Dr. Ford Walker has ideas about this, so as we work with the schools, uh, we can give them some really strategic ways to go about reaching out to families, being persistent and consistent in the strategies they use to, to amplify the importance of school. A couple principals this year have been really purposeful about saying, when school starts, what the expectation is around school start time, and have been really successful in um, improving tardiness rates, for example. So those are just a couple strategies that we're gonna try to spread um, and share out more of, but that's what's going on in schools where you see an improvement in chronic absenteeism. And then the only thing I'll add in is also, in addition to continuing with some of those strategies, um, partnering with our uh, Director of Communications and Family Engagement, 
um, to make sure that we have a really tight handle in terms of some of the cases that are ongoing chronic cases, really figuring out what the challenges are and trying to help families work through some of those challenges in order to get uh, kiddos to school more frequently. And then finally, I'd say um, <laughs> looking at our student support team and looking at that model and looking at how we can think through how to identify cases a little bit sooner before we get to the chronic absentee um, mark is something that uh, we're gonna be prioritizing too moving forward. Okay, great. Thank you very much. So, Ms. Morgan. I, it's kind of, it seems, um, it's new information to me that the way that we follow up on chronic absenteeism, which seems to be potentially quite predictive of some of the things we're trying, like, is sort of, isn't really standardized across buildings. Um, are there, do we have plans to, st I mean, it's one thing to be like, well, these people are doing this and getting these outcomes, but like, I mean, at, at some point, is there are there plans to be more directive over how this is done and, and maybe more directive over like starting school on time every day? Like, are, are we gonna get to a place where it's like, no, like we're, we're gonna do this because it's like really, really important as opposed to just sort of like hoping that- I'd like that to clarify that we've been directive about it in the past as well. Okay. We're seeing stronger and more consistent implementation of those expectations now at the start of the school year. And with some of the new resources that Dr. Ford Walker just mentioned are better able to support those expectations this year. Great, great, good. Okay, any more questions? No. Thank you very much for your presentation, yeah. Dr. Ford Walker. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks all for the time. Yep. And we hope you feel better. Um, and next we have the superintendent's report given by Dr. Ford Walker. Okay, great, thank you, Liz. Um, so I'll start off by sharing that our EL um, expeditionary learning pilot is, I don't even wanna say pilot, but our implementation is currently underway. Um, and we have two grade levels at every elementary school participating. Um, and the teachers who are participating in the implementation are going through a series of professional development learning opportunities um, where they're working together to uh, digest um, the new content and the new expectations and work their way through um, this new um, curriculum. And I'd like to say that I was in a coaches meeting a couple of weeks ago, actually just last week, where I was able to hear directly from some coaches who are supporting teachers in implementation. And um, they were commenting on some of the experiences um, that they have been able to observe and participate in because they're co-teaching with the teachers. And um, a number of them commented, commented did that students are excited about the curriculum and also using um, different language that they're hearing modeled throughout the classroom in their one-on-one -on -one react interactions with one another. So that's exciting to see and hear. Um, so that's going pretty well. Also, um, I'd like to share that the district is the recipient of a $10,000 Safe and Supportive Schools grant awarded by DESE. Um, and there will be more details um, forthcoming on how the grant will be used. Um, also, I'll say that the teaching and learning department had a successful rollout of our professional learning platform, which is an arm of Power Schools um, and Power, excuse me, Power School. Power School is the platform that is the hub for many um, things connected to uh, districts, such as evaluation um, support for educators, as well as uh, it's a platform that helps with managing um, the employee opportunities, so jobs are posted there and people can go there to apply for the positions. Also, there is an arm of the uh, platform that we didn't start using until this year, which is the professional learning platform. And so essentially, all of the offerings that are taking place on the six early release days that exist throughout the district um, are there and educators can log on and um, sign up for courses as well as um, find PDPs after they complete the course there in the platform. So it's making um, the process a little bit more seamless and manageable uh, for educators to maneuver through. And also I'd like to say that we have a number of course offerings that are teacher-led opportunities. 
Um, and some of those examples that you see listed here are being offered by some of our APS educators. Um, moving on, Arlington has been selected um, to be a 2023 Mass Save Climate. As a Mass Save Climate leader, um, being a leader in that particular area is something that's exciting to us and uh, something that we are looking forward to sharing a little bit more about as well moving forward. Um, also, last month, we celebrated two new electric buses on Town Day. Um, and this picture that you see here is with Dr. Holman and uh, Steve Angelo in transportation and APS cutting the ribbon um, at the bus ceremony, uh, which was an exciting time as well. Uh, Dr. Holman shared her evaluation materials uh, earlier this week. Um, and that was uh, the Google site that she shared that had a ton of information there. And I don't know if she's finished with uploading the, her other documents, but um, I'm sure you can stay tuned for more from her around that. And then finally, I'll share that um, we receive additional student at Dallin in grade one, um, which um, has led us to posting a new paraprofessional uh, position um, for Dallin in order to support um, that classroom um, with more staffing. And that is the conclusion of the report. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. Can I, oh sorry, I have, so I have a question for um, the chair. Do we have a timeline for our evaluation? Yes, I will send that out. Okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I was just worried, I'm like, this got presented to us that I didn't know. Yes, what I, yeah. um, yes we will. Okay, and then the other thing, I just wanted to um, make a comment um, it's not in the update, but I, um, I just wanted to share my concerns about um, bracket being closed today and the um, making up the time on learning. I, mean, I feel like a whole day was missed. So I guess my personal expectation is that there will be a day where the students and teachers at bracket will have school. Um, I feel like um, in my three and a little bit years on the school committee recently, there have been a lot of like individual school cancellations and it's just starting to be a concern for me and I just want to share that, so thank you. Um, I had two things, um, mine are relevant to the, where they were in the update mm -hmm. um, and um, although I, I, I am, as somebody with an elementary student and I, I get we can't control water mains but boy is this really hard on, it's really hard. Um, I, uh, we, uh, Dr. Ford Walker, we received, we're like on the everyone APS like distribution list. So we got a chance to see the excellent communication that you sent out to all of our staff around the professional development signups. And um, I just, I thought it was really, really good, um, really clear what they needed to do. Um, so I just thought that was super impressive. So thank you, thank you for your work on that. And then what was the other thing in the update? Oh, so bef between when we last met and now, I went to back to school night at Stratton. I have a fifth grader. And it was really exciting to hear his teacher, who um, is phenomenal and who, who apparently told the kids in the class at the beginning of the year that she had no idea what she was doing, rolling out this new literacy curriculum. And, and she wasn't really sure how it was going to go. And then three weeks into the school year, for her to stand up in front of parents, she was so enthusiastic. Um, so clear um, had like um, she had examples to share with us about what this was going to look like the book that they were reading the things that they were doing um, it was just it was really exciting to see that and to hear somebody speak so um, with a lot of enthusiasm about what they were doing in the classroom um, and I know that all, like she's awesome clearly but I know that that she's able to say that and be enthusiastic because she's been well supported by the literacy coaches by your office Dr. Ford Walker um, and all the way out so um, it was it was really it was a really fun night for me to get to hear that so thank you great thank you thank you for that feedback and I point out your back to school night was not on the school committee night so <laughs> it, it, not. it was a miracle yeah no it was great so it was just like 
I, I think somebody got a calendar out and did some work and it was yeah. very impressive. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Just just to explain for Dr. Ford, this has been a problem in the past and we've tried to make sure it, I mean, we've asked that it not happen and I'm pleased that this year things are much more on track. Thank you. Um, so next we have election of the MASC delegate to the MASC delegate assembly. Uh, do we have a nomination? I nominate Mr. Slickman. Do we have a second? Okay. Second. Second. Enthusiastic. Um, as long as it's not me. I'm sweating this one. <laughs> Ms. Exton, do you want to speak to your nomination? Or? Um, I will just express my appreciation that Mr. Slickman is very committed to um, the MESC and participating as a delegate and attending the meeting every year. And we appreciate you spending your time doing that on behalf of our committee. Okay. Any further comment? Okay. All uh, I'll just comment and say thank you in that our resolution supporting METCO is resolution one this year and I anticipate it will be uh, uh, universally acclaimed by the delegate assembly. Awesome. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Yes. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. So that's a unanimous vote. Does anybody Great. want to be an alternate? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do we have Nothing to can happen. Don't have to. <laughs> I feel like we take that up in the event that it becomes a problem. <laughs> and then. And, and MASD asks for an alternate, but so, you know. I might actually go. So I, I nominate uh, Kersey as the alternate. Second. Um, Second. It's third. <laughs> okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye, Aye I guess. <laughs> <laughs> any abstentions? Any? Nope. Okay. That was also unanimous. So apparently I'm the alternate. Um, I don't know if that means I have to present the other side. <laughs> um, okay, so next we have a vote to approve the APS and AEA MOA, uh, the memorandum of agreement. And I think that was about grade three. Does someone remind me what we're memorandum? We don't have it in, I think we can't do it. We don't have it in Novus. It is. It There's is. something in Novus. Oh, okay. It wasn't, it's not in what I have. Okay, sorry. Let me find Novus. Huh. It doesn't show up as a document on the side. I didn't know it was there. Okay. No, I mean, it shows up if I click on it, but it doesn't, you know, usually it has a little symbol that there's something to download and it doesn't show up there. I wonder if it's because it's not covered yet. That could be. Mm -hmm. it, it does on my, yeah. Can you locate, you can well, see if it's, if it, if it's. All right, I mean, it's here. But so if it's, it's not motion, public. Motion to approve and authorize the. Okay. If, what do you mean if it's not public? It doesn't matter if it's public or not. I second the motion. Okay. Motion to approve and authorize the chair to sign the memorandum of agreement between the Arlington School Committee and the AEA. Sorry. We're talking about the one dated September 18th, right? That's in, yes. That's in notes, yes. right? Okay. The stipend for cafeteria duty for Addison Gibbs. Uh, that's the one we did in the second yeah, yeah, yeah. last year. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, so we're just re revoting yeah. something yeah. we've resolved yeah. already. Yeah. Yep. Yep. I'm just making sure it's yep. properly yep. notified. Yep. We've notified the yep. public. So, okay. So any com any discussion? Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. So that's unanimous. Next, we have the consent agenda. All items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the commu committee so requests in which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence. Warrant number 24072, dated uh, October 3rd, 2023, $860,315.89. Arlington School Committee minutes of September 21st, 2023. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Yes. yes. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Nope. So it's unanimous. And now we have subcommittee and liaison reports. Uh, budget. 
Mr. Cardin. Um, you want to give me a minute? I'll pull up the minutes so I remember what we talked about. Oh, can you come back to me? Okay. Uh, community relations. Sure. Um, the school committee will be having a school committee chat on Tuesday, October 17th at 9 a.m. Uh, Ms. Gittleson and Mr. Thielman have agreed to host it. Thank you very much. And um, as we discussed in the spring in the community relations subcommittee and then shared with the full committee, um, we're modifying the format a little bit. So Dr. Holman and Ms. Ford Walker will also um, be in attendance. And the focus topic um, was the heterogeneous grouping initiative um, and then any other high school topics. Okay. Um, Facilities, Mr. Thielman? Facilities, we meet on <clears throat> November 2nd at 5.15 p.m. It says in the invite 5.15 to 7, but we're not going to use the whole hour and 45 minutes. So, but we're going to receive a number of, of reports that we talked about at the last time and talk about other things. So all are welcome to attend. And, you know, just uh, regarding what Ms. Exton raised earlier, this does relate to facilities, I think. The, um, uh, you have to have 180 days unless, and safety emergency snow days, they're, they're actually equal. So I don't know if what happened at the bracket is equivalent to a safety emergency, but we ought to find out if it is. Mm -hmm. Because if it is, the students, by law, I think have to make up their day. Mm -hmm. So I think we just need to clarify that. Okay. That may not I be a happy so. thing for people to hear right now. Mm -hmm. So, but I think we need to clarify. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. I just don't know. Uh, policy and procedures. Uh, just on the bracket situation, uh, we, we vote the calendar so that if there is an adjustment, that uh, uh, if we go an extra day at the bracket, that just sort of happens. But if any other adjustment or tweak comes on there, we'll need to vote that. Um, it's just another complication in the whole thing. Yeah, it's not, I mean, it's, it's, yeah. It's not anyone's fault. No, no, no. no I mean, water main that broke. Yeah. You can't run a school without water. Yeah. But it, but it, 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 there is a safety there is mm. in that yeah. law that's... Yeah. You, you, yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> no, we've got stuff to do. I got Doug Himes' last email uh, that we're, we'll, we can review on the, uh, uh, on the file that, that we postpone for his review and send it back. Um, so we'll have to set a date for oh, the next meeting. But we don't have a date. Okay. No, we don't have a date, okay. but we'll have to go and, and, and uh, set one. All right. Okay. Uh, building committee? We're meeting on November 14th instead of November 7th because another event is taking place in time on the 7th. Mm -hmm. And then on the December meeting, we're going to meet in person in the new school. And then this committee asked before about a tour. I mean, I'm sorry. The committee asked about... Um, Getting information about you know us us and our move over there, and so what I think we're going to do is arrange a tour towards the end of October for the school committee. Uh, we don't want to do it until the end of October because we have people working overtime right now, and it just there's just not a good environment to kind of add us into the mix and make them work longer. So uh, give us a few weeks. We'll give some dates. We'll put out a doodle poll. We'll figure it out. And if you send us any information we need to be aware of need or need to do in order to prepare for this. Yeah. Yeah. We'll do that. I think the best thing is a tour. Yeah. Then it's just a good visual. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mr. You Card. skipped me. Did I skip you? Yes. Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. I did. Oh, boy. Mm. <laughs> we were doing pretty well. And, uh, well. <laughs> and she's the best, too. She, she runs the best subcommittee. Oh, Ms. Morgan, um, <laughs> we are meeting. See, <laughs> I was mostly just being a brat about being skipped, and I didn't even look it up. Um, we <laughs> are meeting on. Do you want me to wait? <laughs> on, I know, no, we're meeting on October 23rd at 2 p.m. Uh, we are talking about the sixth grade. Uh, not science, whatever it is, overnight experience. Um, and we're also talking about um, special education programs um, with Ms. Elmer. Okay. Um, so actually, either one of us, Ms. Gittleson, because you're the um, CPAC yes. liaison, um, 
could you, would you be able to let them know that that agenda is posted okay. for the 23rd yeah. and um, we're going to, we're going to get a report on um, sort of adjustments, additions um, to programming. So if you don't mind letting them know and that would be awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much. Mr. Cardin, budget. All right, yes, now I'm ready. Um, so we, we talked a little bit about the um, special town meeting. There is a recommended vote of the finance committee, but there's a potential issue with the wording of the Warren article and the timing of town meeting. So we may push that off till April, but we're not sure yet. Um, we, re we revised the budget calendar. I, I will give that to Liz to distribute to all of you. Um, talked a little bit about a funding mechanism to support speakers for the CPAC. Um, hopefully that will come out, come to fruition through the new Welcome Center uh, as that gets established. Um, Michael went over the budget office staffing. That was a useful handout, so I'll also um, give that to Liz to distribute. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Um, and any liaison reports, announcements, or future agenda items? I already got the one that was mentioned. Anything else? Seeing none. Okay. Motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Yes. Aye. Aye. Okay. We're all done.